My name is Gary Trapezano, and I'm the Vice President of Engineering of Moberg ICU Solutions. I am very excited to be hosting our first educational webinar of the year. Before we get started, I have a couple of tips on how to use the webinar technology. If you have questions for the speakers during the presentation, please type them into the chat window. We'll collect the questions as they come in, and at the end of the presentation, we'll have time to address some of them. The questions we don't get to, we will address after the webinar in a follow-up email. If you have any technical difficulties, please let us know by reporting issues in the chat window. This is an overview of our schedule for today. I'm going to introduce our speaker, who will tell us about his background. He will then educate us about spreading the polarizations, starting from the basic science behind them, how to record them in patients, and their clinical importance. At the end, we will have some time for questions. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter. Dr. Jed Hardings is a research associate professor of neurology with the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Cincinnati. He is one of the leading scientists in the field of spreading depolarizations and has been using the Moberg CNS monitor to record EEG and multimodal parameters for his research. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Hardings. Thanks, Gary, and thanks to Moberg Research for the opportunity to provide this uh, introductory overview of spreading depolarizations. I'm going to cover a broad range of topics considering, I think, a, a very diverse background of, um, of the audience here. But this has been an exciting field of research that I've been in for 15 years, starting at the bench and uh, moving to uh, uh, translational clinical studies. Um, and it's a, it's a field where there's been a very rapid evolution of, um, of ideas in translation, both from basic concepts from the bench to the bedside, but also back again, because in many cases where we uh, observe things in the clinical data that we hadn't been elucidated and require clarification in the basic science. So this has been uh, quite an active process. And of course, it's in the basic science lab where we're able to control um, uh, conditions of, of monitoring and uh, really prove concepts. So in my talk, I want to begin there with the basic science of how spreading depolarizations mediate infarct development. And then in the second half, uh, move on to how uh, spreading depolarizations are monitored in patients in terms of the practicalities of um, setting up the recordings and interpreting and displaying the data, and then finally touch on the, uh, the clinical importance um, of why one might want to employ this practice uh, in the clinic. So I'd like to begin with uh, some basic definitions and uh, particularly clarifying the difference between spreading depression and spreading depolarization, both terms of which you've probably heard. Spreading depolarization can be monitored by uh, two electrodes placed in cerebral gray matter with an amplifier that's capable of recording very slow frequencies. And with such an amplifier, you can record a negative, uh, a large amplitude negative slow shift in the baseline potential that lasts a couple minutes. This, this is a negative DC shift, and this is the indicator of a mass depolarization of the cells of the cerebral cortex. And it can be observed to propagate from one location to another at a speed evidencing um, about three millimeters uh, per minute. And it's this depolarization when all neurons go to zero membrane potential that the, the membrane polarity is discharged. And so this prevents the cells from being able to fire action potentials or generate synaptic potentials. So as a consequence of this depolarization, it also, you also observe a silencing of the spontaneous brain activity, which is shown here, and then becomes silent when the depolarization occurs. When the depolarization has passed, the tissue has repolarized, um, 
after a further delay of a few minutes, there's eventually a progressive return of synaptic potentials spontaneously being generated in the brain. And this depression period is what's called spreading depression. And it, of course, um, propagates through the tissue with the depolarization wave. And this illustration is from a, a mouse brain, but um, the exact same fun basic phenomena can be observed in the human cerebral cortex with uh, subdural electrodes placed resting on the surface of the cerebral cortex. So here, for instance, you see the negative shift in slope potential propagating from one electrode to another at a speed, again, of a few millimeters per minute. And the depolarization induces a depression of the brain's spontaneous activity that likewise propagates. And one of the things we have observed um, clinically, which is, which is actually more commonly observed in, in patients than in the laboratory, is that these depolarizations can occur uh, oftentimes in tissue that has no spontaneous baseline activity. So comparing here to here, we can see that the brain in this instance is flatlined. There's no spontaneous activity. That doesn't mean that the, that the brain is dead. Um, rather, to the contrary, the fact that we can observe these repetitive depolarizations uh, indicates that the, that the tissue remains viable. But what's important here, the point I want to make, is that uh, spreading depolarization does not always cause spreading depression because that is in the cases where there is no spontaneous activity to depress. And these are known as isoelectric spreading depolarizations. So depolarizations are the, um, are the more general phenomenon. And we can define the two events. Uh, I won't read through these definitions, but uh, you can look them up here in the uh, papers that are referenced. But again, the bottom line is that spreading depolarization can occur without spreading depression in tissue that's already electrically silent. But spreading depression is always caused by spreading depolarization. So depolarization is the more general phenomenon. And it's also the, the mechanism that causes the uh, injury to tissue. So that's really the focus of our discussion. And it's been shown by a variety of labs over a series of decades that spreading depolarizations are a required mechanism of acute lesion development and that they play a causal role rather than arising simply as an epiphenomenon. And this statement appears to generalize to a wide variety of injury models including mild ischemia, traumatic brain injury, subarachnoid hemorrhage. But the princi principles have been best elucidated in animal models of focal and uh, global cerebral ischemia. So that's what I'll be talking about. A key concept in understanding how depolarizations mediate lesion development is the spreading depolarization continuum. And this will be the last definition. The continuum describes the wide spectrum of depolarization characteristics that can be observed depending on local tissue conditions. These varying characteristics include uh, durations and metabolic responses, for instance. In this figure, for instance, what's shown is the onset of persistent depolarization in the stroke core after a middle cerebral artery occlusion. Within minutes of the occlusion, we see this negative shift in potential. This is the depolarization, and it's persistent. It's, it doesn't recover. And that's because there's severe ischemia in this tissue, and energy is required to repolarize the tissue. This same wave then propagates outward into the penumbra and into normal tissue, where the wave then transitions to a uh, finite uh, duration but prolonged event uh, in the penumbra, where energy supply is in shortage, um, on out to the uh, periphery, where there's uh, normal metabolism and the depolarization is very brief. So in this single wave, you can see the full continuum of depolarization durations. After this initial event, there continue to be recurrent depolarizations uh, over the period of hours and days following the initial injury. And it's these subsequent waves that mediate 
secondary lesion growth. But for the moment, let's focus on this persistent depolarization in the ischemic core because it's this depolarization that establishes the very well-known characteristics of a, a core ischemic injury. And this is illustrated uh, here by showing the changes in extracellular ion concentrations after the onset of severe ischemia. So within seconds of the onset, the EEG activity goes silent, but there's no other major changes in the tissue until the onset of the terminal depolarization. And here the negativity is shown going in the upward direction. And it's only when this occurs that you see the drop in extracellular calcium and sodium as they flux into cells, and there's an efflux of extracellular potassium. As a further consequence of the loss of ion homeostasis, there's also a net movement of water into cells following the sodium and calcium. What this does is cause a beating, as shown in this cartoon, a beating of the, of the dendrites to accommodate the increased uh, intracellular volume, and this is what's known as cytotoxic edema. Again, in the stroke core, this occurs only as a consequence of tissue depolarization, which is illustrated in this experiment, where global ischemia is induced here um, in a rodent brain at time zero, and even looking two minutes after the occlusion, two-photon imaging of the dendrites of the cerebral cortex show normal morphology. You can see here the, the spines of this dendrite, more spines down here. Everything looks intact. The dendrites are linear and continuous. It's not until the moment of depolarization in the tissue, as shown by this steep negative drop, and this time sequence of imaging at uh, about 218 seconds after the depolarization, you can see that this beating onset occurs. You can see the evolution in the morphology here as the spines um, get the appearance of beads on a string. And furthermore, the spines are retracted and no longer visible. The be this beating and swelling causes um, a restriction of the water diffusion in both the intracellular and extracellular compartments. And it's this diffusion restriction that's visualized in diffusion-weighted uh, MRI imaging as one of the earliest indications of neuronal damage, uh, or impending neuronal damage from stroke. Now, diffusion lesions are, of course, reversible. And this is because persistent depolarization is reversible as well, as evidenced by these experiments, by, by this experiment in which, again, uh, global cerebral ischemia is induced by inflating uh, cuffs around the carotid and uh, vertebral arteries. After the last cuff is inflated, um, again, you see the silencing of brain activity, and a few minutes later, the terminal depolarization of tissue. This depolarization persists for some 20 minutes in this experiment until the cuff is deflated, allowing blood flow to reperfuse uh, the carotid arteries, and then eventually we see the increase in blood flow in the cerebral cortex. And it's after the recovery of the cerebral cortex that the, um, that the tissue repolarizes. Even though the depolarization is reversible, even at, after a certain threshold duration of its persistence with concurrent ischemia, there is a point at which neuronal injury becomes irreversible, leading to infarction. And there's no precisely known uh, duration for this threshold, but it's likely on the order of tens of minutes. And the experiment illustrated here elegantly demonstrates that depolarization is an essential process for this infarction to develop. Here, in animals that were subjected to severe ischemia, down to uh, 5, 10, 15 percent of baseline blood flow, only those animals in whom depolarization developed and were allowed to persist for at least 15 minutes went on to develop um, mass neuronal necrosis, as indicated by the filled black uh, symbols. 
and as shown here. Animals that had depolarizations only persisting for 10 minutes or that had no depolarizations at all, despite a long duration severe ischemia at equal levels, uh, no cell death developed. So it appears from, uh, as illustrated by this experiment and many, many more, um, that there are three main requirements for an infarct to develop in the cerebral cortex. The first is ischemia, second is concomitant depolarization of the tissue, and third is time, meaning the persistence of both of the, the prior two conditions. So the schematic here on the left summarizes the development of persistent depolarization in the ischemic core. Recording from the, um, from the zone of, of critical blood flow reduction, what we see is first there's a decrease in cerebral blood flow, followed a few minutes later um, by persistent uh, terminal depolarization, and the depolarization spreads into the penumbra and then into the periphery. So what, it, as summarized in the previous slides, so what about the case of delayed lesion growth? Because even after, even after the initial depolarization, spontaneous, apparently spontaneous spreading depolarization continues to arise for hours and days. And these depolarizations arise from the ischemic penumbra as shown here from recording location three, and they spread into all directions, including in the inward direction towards electrode two, towards electrode one. They can't penetrate electrode one because that's in the persistently depolarized core. It can't depolarize any further. But electrode two, which was previously still viable, still maintained its polarization, it now, due to this, to this propagating wave, the tissue of electrode two is induced into a state of terminal depolarization. So why does, why does this happen there when it was previously maintaining um, membrane integrity? And the reason is that, we can, is that the depolarization wave induces a further degree of ischemia that, that pushes the tissue below the threshold um, beyond which it can, it's not able to repolarize. And this capability of a depolarization wave to uh, induce vasoconstriction is called spreading ischemia. And this is illustrated uh, in this experiment, uh, again, in the, in the rat brain, where a recording from the penumbra of a middle cerebral artery stroke, the recordings are shown here of cerebral blood flow, where you can see each depolarization wave induces a deep decrease in cerebral blood flow, transient one, um, here, here, three, four, five events. But notice also that each depolarization wave decreases the resting uh, baseline level of cerebral blood flow. So that over time, the total area of cortex that's subjected to critical ischemia is much greater than it was initially after the injury. So the combined effect of the depolarization propagating into the penumbra, decreasing blood flow, has the effect of expanding the core area of critical, um, the core area of terminal depolarization. Uh, the, the phenomenon of spreading ischemia was first discovered by uh, Dr. Jens Dreyer, and he's provided this video, which I think is pretty, uh, pretty powerfully illustrates the effect. Now, you can see moving from left to right is a spreading pallor, and you can see the constriction of the peel arteries. These are the vascular changes that are occurring in the wake of a spreading depolarization propagating through this area of cortex. And below on the left and right are uh, cerebral blood flow recordings. Um, the time base is in seconds. So you can see that, that this vasoconstriction is lasting uh, several minutes before blood flow begins to return uh, to baseline levels. <clears throat> 
So what depolarizations are doing is really having a double hit on the tissue. Not only is there the metabolic stress of, of, the, uh, of the depolarization itself together with release of neurotransmitters, intracellular flooding of calcium, but there's also a decrease in energy supply due to the vasoconstriction that the depolarization induces. And as, as a final point on the basic science, one of the, one of the questions that uh, remained, remained puzzling until very recently was how these spontaneous depolarizations continue to arise for hours and, and days after an initial injury. What are the specific triggers of spreading depolarizations? And this was only um, very recently elucid elucidated in a paper by uh, von Bornstadt et al., published in Neuron, which showed that spreading depolarizations, secondary ones, um, arise spontaneously in the ischemic penumbra due to a mismatch of energy supply and demand. It could either be, um, so th what they found was that the inner penumbra, or the, cl the classically defined penumbra, was susceptible to decreases in energy supply, and that an outer ring of penumbra was also susceptible to increases in demand. And their results are, are illustrated here showing that it's the energy supply demand mismatch in the penumbra that triggers depolarization. So they were able, for instance, to increase um, energy demand by, by applying simple innocuous uh, stimulation um, to sensory regions that mapped onto the ischemic penumbra. And as soon as the sh shoulder stimulation begins, the um, oxyhemoglobin content in the tissue drops, followed by the triggering of a depolarization um, in that exact location. They could decrease supply uh, by uh, two different means, uh, just inducing very brief periods of hypoxia or very brief periods of hypotension. In both cases, within a minute or two of the onset, they could observe depolarizations to arise in the inner region of the penumbra. So to summarize this section, it seems that it, there are three components required for infarction, ischemia, depolarization, and time. The ischemic, the ischemic component of that triad can be triggered by one of two things, either an independent vascular insult, such as in the case of an initial depolarization, or it can be triggered by the depolarization wave itself, as occurs in the case of delayed um, lesion expansion. Furthermore, the secondary lesion growth is mediated by recurrent spontaneous. We know that now that they're not spontaneous, that they're triggered um, by supply-demand mismatches in the penumbra. And they cause lesion growth by expanding the, term, the, the zone of the terminally depolarized core. And again, as long as that depolarization persists for a threshold duration, the tissue will become infarcted. And so we can carry over um, several points from this in, in order to interpret and understand uh, why we might want to, want to monitor depolarizations in patients. And really there's two uh, key concepts that I want to communicate, and that's the, the occurrence of depolarizations, if we were to observe it in a patient's brain, would indicate, based on the basic science, that first of all, there's still critical metabol metabolic instability. There, there's vulnerable penumbra that's continuing to evolve as evidenced by the fact that a depolarization was triggered. And secondly, that there's ongoing lesion growth, which is based on the, on the idea proven in ischemic stroke and several other diseases, um, at least in the laboratory, that these depolarizations have causal effects uh, to expand um, lesion sizes. So the Clinical translation of this research began now uh, 15 years ago with the publication of Dr. Strong's uh, study using electrode strips to monitor patients 
with acute brain injury. This research was uh, subsequently pursued by the COSBID uh, Research Consortium, who've continued to refine and develop the techniques uh, first established by Dr. Strong. And some techniques have evolved, others haven't. So what I'd like to start the second half of the talk with um, a review of the basic techniques and uh, of, of placing electrode strips and making recordings in patients. And so beside the observation of the, uh, spreading depolarizations uh, commonly in, in brain injured patients, uh, Dr. Strong's really seminal contribution, I think, was providing the community with a method that could be widely adopted by neurosurgeons and neurointensivists, which is the use of these linear six-electrode uh, subdural strips um, to monitor patients who require uh, craniotomy for uh, decompression or evacuation of hematomas, clipping of aneurysms, et cetera. These electrode strips can be placed in these operative patients um, following the surgery before uh, closing the skull and uh, returning the patient to the intensive care unit. And there at the intensive care unit, the, um, the electrode strip can simply be connected to um, an EEG monitor uh, to continuously assess for the occurrence of depolarizations. And just a few uh, comments here on the electrode strip placement. Uh, it's, it's a commonly asked question. Um, and to illustrate good placement of the strip, here we're using a, a cadaver um, with a hypothetical injury in this location with a contusion and a, and a uh, penumbra. And the figure here on the left illustrates good placement of the electrode strip. Uh, this black line indicates a, the path of a hypothetical spreading depolarization. And this is good placement because uh, the, the depolarization is going to contact most of these electrodes along the strip, allowing us to document uh, its propagation. On the right-hand side is an example of a, a less than ideal poor placement of the electrode strip, where the strip's kind of farther away from the injury. Uh, it's, it's really not too certain yet how, how widely spreading depolarizations propagate in the injured brain. It probably varies quite a bit from one patient to another. There's some evidence that uh, they don't propagate very, very widely. Other evidence uh, suggests to the contrary that they, they go quite far. Um, but we know that they do have difficulty spreading across uh, uh, traversing sulci, going down through the sulci and coming back on the other side to the adjacent gyrus, and particularly across uh, ma major fissures such as uh, the sylvian fissure here. Um, so we prefer not to place the electrode strips across these major uh, fissures, and preferably along a single gyrus. And there's furthermore a few key tips to uh, avoiding complications in using this technique. The first seems fairly obvious, yet nonetheless, um, it's very important to exit the electrode strip uh, through a burr hole. Um, so and rather than uh, having it get pinched between the uh, bone flap when it's replaced and the adjacent intact skull. Uh, secondly, you have to continue to provide a sufficient tunnel for the, for the, uh, for the lead to exit uh, beneath the scalp and out through the, the scalp incision. Um, this has to be wider than, than to allow simply the tail to pass. It has to be wider because um, when monitoring is terminated, the electrode strip is removed at the bedside by pulling the strip um, through the burr hole and then out through the tunneled um, portion and out, out through the, the uh, scalp incision. So it, all of that tunneling has to be wide enough to accommodate this strip and not simply the tail of the strip. And finally, a key, um, a key tip is, is to be sure that the, the tail of the electrode strip, after being exteriorized, uh, needs to be coiled and then uh, anchored with sutures uh, to the scalp. And the coiling and, and anchoring provide uh, strain relief against pulling and accidental um, dislodgement or removal of the electrode strip by the patient or, or staff. But this is all um, rather straightforward for, the neuros for neurosurgeons. Um, 
Once the patient returns to the intensive care unit, the procedures are pretty simple. Um, the first thing you do is place a ground electrode, which can go on the shoulder or on the scalp, and then also to place a reference electrode, which is typically a, a subdermal uh, platinum needle that gets placed at the mastoid or the frontal apex. Here's one of the um, uh, subdermal needles uh, shown here. You then connect the electrode, um, the lead wire from the electrode strip to a ribbon cable that then gets plugged into the amplifier and then plug all of the um, leads into the amplifier and you can begin monitoring. And so here, for instance, is shown the, uh, the face of the amplifier from uh, Moberg ICU Solutions. Uh, this is the advanced ICU EEG amplifier that allows uh, combined EEG monitoring as well as um, ECOG monitoring from these electrode strips. And here you just see the, uh, the placement of six lead electrodes from the strip as well as the connection of a ground and a reference. And so if performed correctly, this is the type of data that can be recorded with this technique. Here we show recordings from three electrodes of the strip. And on, on each channel occur two spreading depolarizations, moving from electrode one to two to three, and in the same sequence here. And we can see here very clearly that the two main component, components that I've reviewed, the negative direct current shift that identifies depolarization, and also the spreading depression of higher frequency activity. So let me now further explain how to obtain these recordings and how these differ from conventional EEG, because there are uh, pretty considerable differences and I think many people come to this field with a background in uh, clinical EEG. So in the raw data acquisition, we get recordings similar to what are shown here. Now, again, this is the same trace as shown in the previous slide. So the first thing to notice here is the extreme time compression of the data display. So this is the 10-minute scale bar. So this is two to three hours worth of data uh, being shown. We recommend generally that uh, no less than 30 minutes per page is displayed when reviewing uh, these data. And the reason is that, of course, the depolarization itself lasts several minutes. And to observe a wave propagate across five centimeters of tissue, which is the length of the strip, at three millimeters per minute is going to take 10 to 15 minutes. Secondly, um, note the DC here, which indicates that this is a full band or direct current recording. What that means is that the amplifier is capable of recording very, very slow changes all the way down to the theor theoretical limit of uh, zero hertz or the DC offset. That's also in contrast to EEG, as I'll explain. Um, the third is to notice the amplitude of these signals. Uh, this is the scale bar of 15 millivolts. Uh, we never talk about millivolts in terms of EEG because this is 100 to 1,000 times larger than the waveforms we typically observe on EEG. And you can compare and contrast here with the typical um, EEG uh, recording where, again, we're, we're monitoring in contrast to ECOG and spreading depolarizations. We're now looking at a very expanded, uh, zoomed-in time scale um, of seconds, typically 10 to 30 seconds per page, so that we have sufficient detail to examine individual waveforms to look for epileptic spikes or theta rhythms or whatever it might be. And again, the amplitudes typically in the range of hundreds of microvolts or less, um, which contrasts with uh, events on the scale of 15 to 20 millivolts. And the difference um, 
in EEG versus ETOG can be understood by understanding that brain activity contains a mixture of different frequencies, as shown here in this recording, where there's an offset potential, which is the, which is the baseline, or the average of, of the whole signal. There's slowly changing components, and then there's very fast changing components uh, riding on top of the slowly changing components. And just as white light can be broken down into its component wavelength, so too can these brain waves uh, be broken down into their component frequencies, um, starting with the offset or, or direct current component, uh, then to very slowly changing events, and on up into higher frequency events. And what's typically done to record EEG is to filter out all of these low frequency and DC components so that we only see these fast traces, which are much lower amplitude. And that's what give us, gives us the uh, recordings that, that we're used to. In ECOG, by contrast, we record all the frequencies, which can be appreciated by examining uh, this trace, which contains four FDs. And if we zoom in on one of these events, again, we can see the mixture of the various components. We see the slow negative shift that indicates depolarization. Riding on top of this, we see the spontaneous brain activity, which becomes depressed in amplitude at the start of the depolarization and remains depressed after the depolarization is recovered. So by filtering out the slow potential component, we can view more easily these high frequency components, that is the spreading depression aspect, and obtain a trace that looks something like this. And if we further, um, this is still a very compressed time scale, 10 minutes, um, but we can then further zoom in on that and expand uh, and, and look at the individual waveforms um, on a finer time scale. So this really kind of illustrates how you go from these time compressed um, all uh, DC recordings with, with all frequency components and how they relate back to the um, fast oscillations that we typically examine in EEG recordings. And this is an example of what this looks like, what this can, can look like uh, at the bedside with a, with a data monitoring and, and acquisition system. Here we're showing um, the display with the uh, component neuromonitoring system with the advanced ICU amplifier uh, from Moberg uh, ICU. And we can see these two components that I've been emphasizing. The spreading depression of the high frequency activity is contained in the, the white traces you can see here a narrowing of the amplitude in electrode five, followed by four, three, and then one. And we can also display uh, as an overlap, as, as an overlay, um, the low frequency components, which here are shown with negative going upwards. Um, and here's the negative shift on electrode five, four, three, and then one, indicating a spreading depolarization. And in other displays, of course, we can uh, zoom in on the high frequency components on a much faster time scale. Here, this is four seconds compared to 15 minutes uh, in order to look at the individual waveforms. And we can see uh, these recurrent sharp waves um, every two seconds occurring on electrode two. And this is just another example of a, of a bedside display um, here we're showing uh, a full four hours worth of data, highly time compressed, um, with data recorded from, from scalp EEG as well as the uh, subdural electrode strip. On the electrode strip with this overlaid display, um, we see four depolarizations. They're continuously recurring every hour or so. And it's interesting in this case, if we look at the uh, scalp EEG, um, if you squint a little bit, it helps, but you can see here uh, this narrowing of the amplitude in the first two channels that occurs uh, simultaneous with the uh, depolarizations from the subdural recordings, and they match up one-to-one -one with one event here, two, three, and four. <clears throat> 
For more detailed analysis, there are various um, software programs that you can use. Um, if, if your monitoring system allows you to export data in a common um, data analysis format, like binary or MATLAB, for instance, uh, these data can be in, uh, uh, imported into software uh, for more detailed analysis and signal processing. And the one that's been most commonly used as, is LabChart, uh, which can be obtained from AD instruments. So the, the COSBIT group now has uh, quite some experience applying these methods, having monitored over five, well over 500 patients at centers throughout the United States and Europe, and now um, also at a center in Japan. And what we've consistently found, no matter what country, no matter what medical center, is a, a relatively constant incidence of spreading depolarization findings in patients with these various uh, uh, disease categories. Uh, with traumatic brain injury and intracerebral hematoma, we find about a 50 to 60 percent incidence. Uh, it's higher in aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, 75 to 80 percent of patients with Fisher grade 3 or worse, um, and then a 90 to nearly 100 percent incidence in patients with uh, malignant ischemic stroke. So again, these are all patients that um, clinically require a craniotomy um, or at least placement of an, of an ICP monitor um, that allows also placement of a subdural electrode strip. So why monitor spreading depolarizations in patients? And I've just listed here a number um, of, the, of the indications and rationale, which I'll illustrate as I go through and present um, briefly some, some of the clinical data. But first, simply consider that this is a direct measure of neuronal health and function. Um, that makes it pretty unique among neuromonitoring modalities. Um, the only exception um, being EEG, which also monitors neuronal function, but this does so on a much more uh, detailed, fine-grained level of um, membrane polarization as it relates to, to lesion growth. Um, so it's, it's, direct, it's a direct organic measure of the tissue that we're trying to protect in caring for patients. Um, it's an indicator of um, lesion growth and metabolic instability as, as we consider from the, um, from the basic science data. But importantly, uh, Spreading depolarizations are a heterogeneous mechanism. We see them in some patients and not in others, and they occur with different patterns. And in many cases, they, they are the etiologic basis of clinical deterioration, and so they should be monitored for that reason. And in the future, I think that they really can be uh, a basis for personalized therapy um, for targeting uh, neuroprotection treatments. That remains somewhat to be validated. But just to illustrate some of these points, um, we'll start with uh, traumatic brain injury. And on the right-hand side is a display of depolarization data over seven days uh, in the intensive care unit through a series of um, consecutive patients that had depolarizations. So the 40% that had none aren't, are not shown here. This is the 60% that had them. And you can see how heterogeneous these patterns are. Some patients have very sporadic events. The individual events are shown as these black tick marks. Uh, other patients have these clusters of continuous activity that continue for hours and days. And from monitoring a large series of 138 patients, what we found is that classification of these different patterns of depolarizations is a highly significant predictor at P less than 0.0008. Um, highly significant predictor of worse outcomes. And uh, this predictive value is independent of a patient's baseline uh, progno prognosis based on um, pupillary status and Glasgow coma score and all the other known best um, prognostic factors in traumatic brain injury. In subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, depolarizations are even more common, 80% or so. 
but where the interesting dynamic lies in, in, in patients with ruptured aneurysms is in the time course where we see this very clear um, a bimodal distribution of events in time after aneurysm rup rupture with an early peak and then a waning of activities and then an increase again around day five to eight, which is the time of uh, typically of delayed cerebral ischemia and new infarcts. And analyzing a series of patients, uh, Dr. Dreyer was the lead uh, investigator here, found that the occurrence of a new cluster of depolarizations at this delayed time period had an 86% positive predictive value and 100% negative predictive value for de delayed cerebral ischemia, including uh, new onset neurologic deficits and infarcts. And I would encourage you to look at, look at this um, paper published in Brain in 2006 in some detail to really see how the time course of the depolarization precisely relates to uh, patients' uh, de declining consciousness, for instance, in GCS from 11 to 9, uh, et cetera, and also correlates with uh, fluctuating neurologic symptoms. I showed before in animals how depolarizations also cause a spreading ischemia, and this finding is also um, translated to the human brain, where uh, in some series of patients, a cerebral blood flow monitor was placed next to the electrode strip for combined blood flow and electrical recordings. And as illustrated here was a case of spreading ischemia, where here is a depolarization wave moving from electrode 3 to electrode 5. And then simultaneous with the, or immediately following the depolarization wave, is a dip in cerebral blood flow that also propagates with the wave. So that's a spreading ischemia. And here's another case of two events. And you can see that it gets worse through time. The initial spreading ischemia here is very brief, followed by a longer hyperperfusion but now it's transitioning as the tissue deteriorates to a longer duration ischemia. And notice that the time base here, this is about a five minute period of, uh, of severe ischemia induced by this depolarization wave. And the decrease in blood flow also triggers decreases in partial pressure of uh, tissue oxygenation, uh, as shown here in this case. Um, and while these examples here show relatively brief five-minute periods of ischemia or decreased um, uh, brain oxygenation locally, um, in some cases, the spreading ischemic events can be very prolonged. And so here's a case, again, with worsening through time. This is a dip, an initial dip due to a, um, a spreading depolarization. And the next wave of depolarization induces this very long-lasting, several hours worth of very severe ischemia. Another very important point is that depolarizations, when we observe them in patients, they always, most often, they occur independent of secondary insults as measured by the common neuromonitoring modalities, such as ICP and CPP. And just as an illustration of this, for instance, we measured arterial, um, mean arterial pressure in, at the time of occurrence of over 1,600 spreading depolarizations from 54 different patients. And the mean arterial pressure in 97% of those cases was within the normal accepted clinical range of over 70 millimeters of mercury. The same thing is true for intracranial pressure, 98% of 1,200 spreading depolarizations occurred when ICP was less than 20 millimeters of mercury. Similar findings are found for CPP, brain tissue oxygenation, cerebral blood, blood flow, et cetera. So the monitoring of depolarization importantly provides independent information. And simply as, as a case example of this, this is, this is a patient with a traumatic brain injury who, at the end of his intracranial monitoring, his GCS had improved to 13, ICP was controlled, CPP was in a good range, the temperature, brain body temperature were good, 
And so they decided to terminate intracranial monitoring. But looking at the ECOG data, we see that there was still ongoing organic brain injury as indicated by the occurrence of these repetitive uh, depolarizations. So that raises the provocative question of whether or not an intensive care and intensive neuromonitoring should have continued and whether we perhaps should have done something differently um, based on these recordings. And finally, um, these results from multimodal monitoring showing the independence of spreading depolarization suggests a very strong advantage of ECOG for uh, remote detection of ongoing, uh, uh, of developing ischemic zones, especially when they are focal and perhaps distant, distant from um, the location of our intracranial monitors. And this can be understood here in this schematic where we have a theoretic a hypothetical um, core of ischemic injury or contusion with a penumbral zone of, of critical instability. When these zones develop or as they evolve, if our monitors are located remotely, as they almost always are, sometimes in the opposite hemisphere, they're not able to detect these changes um, when they develop focally and, distant, and, and distally to, to the probes. Uh, that, however, the advantage of ECOG is that they can detect um, developing changes uh, at this location because uh, these instances of uh, energy supply demand mismatch triggering depolarizations will cause the depolarizations to propagate and reach the electrode strip. So this is a real advantage, I believe, of, of monitoring ECOG and paying attention to depolarization data. So I hope now that um, I've provided a little bit of evidence to support uh, some of these reasons for uh, why to, to monitor spreading depolarizations uh, in patients. Um, and I've, I've covered a lot of territory here, but I would just like to highlight that most of this content can be found um, in much more detail in uh, two consensus articles that were published uh, last year. They're, they're still in press for the hard copy, um, but they uh, are consensus articles from the COSBIT group that describe uh, the basic science and then also the clinical science of recording, analyzing, and interpreting depolarizations in the intensive care unit. So those who are interested can, um, uh, I would highly recommend those papers. I would also like to invite uh, anyone who is interested in learning more participating in this research to attend the uh, International Conference on Spreading Depolarizations in Berlin. That's coming up uh, a month from now. Uh, the COSBA group has always met annually and it's open to everyone. And so to communicate that, um, you don't have to be a member of COSBA or do any clinical monitoring. Um, to reflect that, we changed the name this year to the ICSD. Uh, so we welcome you there. You can uh, find the registration links from the uh, COSBID website. And finally, I'd like to invite anyone who would like to get some more uh, input, uh, some more exposure to these ideas to view a documentary video. It's about 27 minutes long that was put together as a collaboration between COSBID and Moberg Research. Um, it contains interviews with lots of different uh, neurointensivists and really tells the, st the story of how uh, uh, changing about these, uh, how thinking about these phenomena has changed uh, over the past uh, few decades. So with that, I'm sorry for going over. I'm sure I did. Um, but I would just like to uh, thank and acknowledge the community at large. Um, who have uh, contributed to developing all these exciting ideas and um, uh, sharing them openly and uh, many times collaborating on uh, translational stuff and, and clinical data. And I thank uh, you all for being attentive and uh, tuning in this afternoon. Gary, over to you. Thank you, Jed. That was an excellent talk. Now with the time we have left, we will go through some of the questions that have been presented by the audience. Um, if you haven't already, please type in your questions for the speakers in the chat window, and we'll address as many as we can 
within our time constraints. And if we don't get to your question, don't worry. We will formulate a response to the questions and email all registered participants. So the first question that came in is, how do we know which came first, ischemia or depolarization? It, it, it differs in the different, um, it can differ in different situations. Um, if I can switch back to an earlier slide. At, at the time of onset of a vascular insult, uh, of course, the, the blood flow decrease can, will trigger depolarizations, and, and any, any kind of ischemic event in the brain will trigger a depolarization. In that case, uh, it's, it's very clear um, that the ischemia precedes it. But we also know from doing careful experiments in animals and now also from uh, careful monitoring in patients um, that the reverse can occur as well. Um, the only way to answer that in a particular instance is by monitoring both events. Um, but it's very clear from the time course of this monitoring and doing controlled experiments that um, the depolarization wave can indeed induce a, uh, this severe vasoconstriction. Um, and what that reflects is um, a disturbance of neurovascular coupling that we see in the, in the healthy brain. So the normal vascular, uh, microvascular response to the intense metabolic demand of, depo of a depolarization wave is a large increase in cerebral blood flow. And as you change conditions of the cortex and interfere with that neurovascular coupling, you can very clearly exper experimentally show that um, the normal hyperemia becomes converted to a spreading vasoconstriction instead. Thank you. The next question is, have electrode strips been used for clinical decision making outside of research protocols? Yes, they have been. Um, there are a few centers, and I think that they're a little bit more ahead of, uh, ahead of us in Europe on that front than, than we are. Um, it seems the Americans like lots and lots of evidence before they uh, want to do anything. But there are a number of centers in, uh, in Europe that, that, are, that are using the data clinically. Um, how, how exactly um, I, would, I would prefer to have them kind of provide testimony on that, but um, that could possibly be a, a topic for a future, future webinar. Sure. I mean, yeah. the, the first and obvious things are to uh, um, adjust your cerebral perfusion pressures and check your uh, the plasma glucose um, and pay a little bit more careful attention to um, to the normal variables. Thank you, Jen. Another question is, um, there are actually two questions that are similar, so I'll read them both. Um, is there a way to estimate SD onset from EEG, and then parenthetically, uh, as in the frequency domain, as a power drop? And this is yep. assuming no high-pass filter. And then as a related question, uh, there's one, do you think that EEG could be replaced, could, could um, you know, re replace this invasive method? There are two papers that uh, address this question um, with, with pretty similar findings, and they investigated the scalp correlates, scalp EEG correlates of uh, events that were confirmed with uh, subdural electrode strip monitoring. And essentially what, what we found was that using the, using the subdural strip data as a guide, we could clearly see correlates in the, in the scalp EEG. And particularly what we found was that um, you could observe a depression in the scalp EEG signal that uh, was particularly clear when there's high amplitude uh, delta activity in, in the baseline, uh, delta slowing in the scalp EEG. This, I think, my belief is that this provides a very high amplitude contrast for 
uh, observing a reduction in activity when the underlying cortex generating that signal goes silent. Um, so I, I don't know if I don't. There's no evidence really that that this is specific to any frequency band. It should affect all frequencies. Um, that's what the um, uh, subdural recording data indicate. Um, but it seems easiest to detect when there's a high amplitude uh, delta activity background. And in fact, what we found was that you know there's there's commonly fluctuating. Um, uh, high amplitude delta with, with periods that, that lack that, and it can go back and forth. And what we found is that, uh, by and large, these fluctuations are explained by spreading depolarizations. Um, there just isn't enough data yet to, to really say whether every time there's a fluctuation in this, uh, an increase or a decrease in, in delta slowing, uh, that's explained by spreading depolarizations or not. I, I don't know about that. It's definitely an area that uh, I consider very promising, and it's, it's a future aim of, um, of several studies. It's going to require more work. Um, but uh, to answer the second part of the question, uh, I, I think it's extremely promising that uh, uh, non-invasive methods could someday supplant the use of intracranial uh, of ECOG. Now, I think ECOG is very safe, and I would always recommend to be to, for it to be used in patients where where it's safe. Um, but to be able to to start monitoring very reliably patients that don't need um, craniotomies, I think it's I think it's very uh, feasible um, in in the future, or very very hopeful that that can be developed, um, per particularly given the the promising EEG data that we already have. Um, if, if that were combined perhaps with a second um, modality um, of non-invasive monitoring, such as um, uh, near-infrared spectroscopy, if that can, um, if those signal and source pairs can be uh, focused uh, enough, um, that, that could be a very attractive um, uh, future direction. Thank you. Another and question. There are one or two centers that have, have started looking at that. Thank you. Another question is what is the relationship between SDs and seizures, periodic discharges, et cetera, that we see on standard EEG, either scalp or intracranial? Boy, that's a tough one. Um, it, call, it involves very, very careful analysis of massive quantities of data. Um, but we, we have looked carefully at a, a few smaller series, and what I, can, what I can generally say is that if one is occurring, it's more, it's more likely than not that the other is, is occurring as well or is going to occur. Um, patients with seizures and, and tend to um, be co-associated with, with, with um, spreading depolarization activity. Um, and it, it's been shown uh, experimentally, uh, the occurrence of multiple SDs in tissue uh, increases the excite, the long, the longer, has a long-term effect to increase excitability. By long-term, I mean hours and days, not, not talking about epileptogenesis here. Um, but it, it alters the, um, the balance of excite, uh, excitation and inhibition in the tissues such that seizures are more likely. Um, the relationship between seizures and SD is extremely complex. They, they can co-occur. Um, sometimes we observe them as um, oscillating patterns where uh, seizures will occur and then they'll be interrupted by a spreading depolarization and then more seizures and, and that will kind of continue. Other times we'll see um, seizures in one section of tissue and depolarizations in the adjacent section of tissue so that they're never spatially overlapping, but they appear to provide some kind of functional block for each other. And there was an example of that that I showed um, with the uh, continuous sharp wave discharges on electrode two. And that was the one electrode that didn't participate in the spreading depolarization. So that appeared to, 
to provide some kind of functional block in the tissue. It's, it's a very complicated uh, topic, I think. Um, and as far as presentation in the scalp, I would say that, that most of um, most of all of these depolar and I'm talking now about depolarizations, only the ones, or I'm sorry, seizures that we observe on the ECOG strip. Um, the majority of those that we see are not manifested on the scalp. Okay, thank you. The um, there's a really two two questions in one, and they may have been covered in your talk, but I, I will um, I'll ask them anyway uh, for you know maybe a little more elaboration. So the question is, which patients do you believe will take advantage of this monitoring? And which clinical implications do you anticipate? Well, I, I think that um, the, the nearest hope for really making a, a quantifiable difference for patients and um, is, is in patients with ruptured aneurysms because the, the syndrome of delayed cerebral ischemia is so well defined. Um, and so enigmatic, it has been so enigmatic, and we've just gone through a major uh, shift in thinking um, away from vasospasm. I mean, it's, it's now, I think, um, entering mainstream consciousness that, uh, or acceptance that it's not all about vasospasm, and, it, and the explanatory power of, um, of vasospasm is, is, is rather weak. And so that field's, um, I think, more uh, more rapidly gravitated towards accepting um, depolarizations for what for what they are and what they uh, might be. Uh, and I'm further optimistic about subarachnoid hemorrhage because there's very because nimodipine is already an, an accepted uh, treatment and nimodipine antagonizes. Um, not only spreading depolarization waves, but it also antagonizes this uh, spreading ischemia uh, microvascular response to depolarization. So it can, it can revert a massive vasoconstriction into a, um, a neutral response or a slightly hyperemic one. Um, so the idea that this, we know that this works clinically and there are new formulations coming out that may work even better um, or, or rather, uh, new delivery methods. Um, the fact that it works clinically and also antagonizes depolarization, I think, is it's. I'm um, hopeful that it'll be shown in the future that uh, depolarizations are the mechanism by which uh, nimodipine improves outcomes for patients and and prevents DCI. And so the the idea then would be. Uh, if that concept is proven, um, we can individualize patient care by titrating the amount of dose uh, based on whether or not we detect, um, you know, new depolarization or intensified depolarization activity in a particular patient. If they have no depolarization activity, there's no point in treating, and there, therefore we can um, you know, avoid the side effects in patients where uh, there's no expected benefit. And we've, we've never previously been able to um, base our treatments, um, especially in, in, in these large clinical trials of NMDA receptor antagonists and, and other things, uh, we've never been able to base the treatment or the selection for inclusion into a trial based on monitoring of the brain. So I think that that's, I think that's a very exciting um, uh, potential for this, and that applies doubly, I think, for traumatic brain injury. Thank you. Um, there's a question related uh, to um, the treatment, and the question is, would you say that we should prevent spreading the polarizations in every patient who could have an ischemic lesion, for instance, using anti-epileptics? I, I, yes, I believe that every I believe that every patient would do better if 
depolarizations never occurred or if there were a safe way to, to block them. Um, of course, once you get into treatments, you always have to talk about side effects or adverse effects of the drugs. Or, um, and so then it's always a question of, of balance of benefit versus harm. And I, I really, I wouldn't want to weigh in on that. You'd have to carefully consider each candidate compound um, and, and, do a, and do a trial to, to, prove, to prove it. Thank you. Um, there's a, another question is, could monitoring of depolarization be helpful with the research that is being done with stem cell treatment of stroke? For example, the work that uh, Dr. Gary Steinberg at Stanford is doing. I, I, I can't immediately see the connection. Um, I, I presume the implication would be to use stem cells or enhance uh, proliferation of uh, re replacement of neurons that are lost um, due to acute injury, due to depolarizations, um, by, by stimulating stem cell um, activation and differentiation in a longer term, probably long after in, in the rehabilitation phase. Um, but I can't, I can't see too much how those uh, factors would interact in acute care. Thank you. And then uh, another question is, can spreading depolarizations be recorded with clinical EEG amplifiers? In short, uh, with, with probably one or two exceptions, uh, the answer is no. Most clinical EEG amplifiers, um, many of them anyway, will only go down to a, um, only record down to a frequency of about a half a hertz or 0.1 hertz. And that's enough to record the spreading depression of activity. Um, so. Uh, but, but really having the slow potential, the negative shifts of slow potential, is really uh, required to, to um, determine whether spreading depolarizations are occurring or not. Um, and so most amplifiers don't, don't allow you to record those slow frequencies. The exception, of course, is uh, the Moberg uh, advanced ICU amplifier. Thank you. And then we have one last question, and then we'll wrap it up because we're getting close to our time limit. If we block all forms of depolarization, what about the areas that have a normal response to SD, for example, vasodilation? Right. And um, that's a very good, it's a very good question. Um, so if we record a normal-looking short uh, depolarization on our electrode strip. Um, maybe rec record the vasodilatory response as well. That appears like a good SD. Well, we've, what we've got to bear in mind is that's only those are only the effects of that wave at the site of our monitoring. The question is what's happening somewhere else where we're not monitoring. And I think the suspicion is, and, and the the. Um, the animal models bear this out, a, a majority or a large percentage of depolarizations are going to cause injury when they hit vulnerable tissue. So I think the safe assumption is that, um, is that most, we should treat most depolarizations as if that's the case, even if we're not recording that effect specifically in the vulnerable tissue. So yeah, I think that they all should be blocked because all depolarizations are going to have those um, more benign characteristics when they occur in normal tissue. But that's not evidencing what they can, what they may be doing. It's not capturing what they may be doing um, in, in distant tissue. And that that's really the point that I was trying to make, um, albeit a bit hurriedly. Um, with the remote monitoring um, of ischemic zones by um, the electrode strips. 
Okay, thank you, Jen. And if uh, now for the people that did submit questions, we did combine some similar some questions that were similar to one another or ask them at the same time. If you feel your question did not get answered properly or uh, get addressed, please um, type it into the chat window and we will pick that up and then send that out afterwards. Um, in the coming weeks, we will be posting a recorded video of this webinar on www.moberg.com. So um, be sure to visit our website where you can also subscribe to our newsletter. And also, please visit Moberg ICU Solutions YouTube channel where you can find the full COSBID video that Jed mentioned in his presentation. I want to thank Dr. Harding for joining us, for um, uh, giving this presentation. I want to thank all of the attendees for joining us, and um, we plan to have follow-up webinars on this topic uh, in the, uh, hopefully in the handful of months, in the next couple, coming months. So um, thank you again, for everyone, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Jed. Bye-bye now.